Wednesday nights, I'm going to be taking you through the entire book of Acts. We're going to go inside Acts, and we want Acts to get inside of us. Amen? How many of you want the power of God to flow in your life? So we're going to take a new look at this book, a fresh approach to it, and we want to activate it, basically. We're going to go chapter by chapter activating what this historical document proves. If it could happen then, it can happen now. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia, Samaria, describing in detail the the conversion of the Gentiles, which brought great joy to all the brothers. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they declared all that God had done with them. But some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, it is necessary to be circumcised to order them, anybody, Gentiles, to keep the law of Moses. These are Pharisees that believe Jesus is the Messiah, but you must keep the law of Moses. You must be circumcised. So there's the two sides of the debate. The apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter. And after there had been much what? Discussion. Mine says debate. All right. (laughs) How many church meetings have you been in when you have two opposing sides? It starts with discussion. It moves to debate. Listen to this, though. You ready for it? Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth... The Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as He did to us. He made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their heart by faith. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus just as they will. Who said that? Peter. Peter. I'm thinking Peter had a big change and a revelation. Somebody helped him. Who was that? Paul. And now he recognizes, and this statement right here in verse 11 is the statement, it's the statement of the Reformation. It's the statement for the church to understand. Salvation is by what? Faith. If your salvation is based on whether you're circumcised, what does faith now become? Works. This is big. You already know this stuff, so it's not so big to you. But this is important. You've got to remember, it's always by believing. It's always been by faith from first to last. So Peter says that. All the assembly fell silent. Then they listened to Barnabas and Paul as they related the signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. Wow. You can't argue. You know? You got Peter, you got Paul talking about all these miracles and everything else. You still had 10 other apostles there too. And now here's the clincher. You ready for this? When they finished speaking, James replied, Brothers, listen to me. Simon has related how God first visited the Gentiles to take them from them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree. All right, so James stands up. Who's James? Head of the church at Jerusalem, which as a matter of fact, makes him the head of the church. Universal. He's the brother of Jesus. Tells us in the book of Galatians, once Jesus rose from the dead, he visited Peter, and he visited James, his brother. Could you imagine that visit? Because James didn't believe Jesus was the Messiah. You know, James is probably crying, my crazy brother. 
went and got himself killed. Then he gets a knock on the door. (laughs) What? But he becomes the head of the church. He is the elder of the church in Jerusalem. They say, Christian history says he had camel knees. In other words, calloused knees, so calloused, they look like camel knees, because he spent a lot of time talking to his brother. James also, it is said, was favored by many Jews because he kept all Jewish law and kept all the Jewish feasts. Just because you're Jewish doesn't mean you can't receive Christ. He he received Christ and still celebrated it all. But he didn't make Gentiles become Jews. They were all followers of Christ. Now, James stands up. It's one thing to have opinions. We have opinions based on what Peter experienced. Ah, yeah, well, that was your experience. Maybe that was a one-off. You and those Cornelius Italian guys. Paul and Barnabas are talking about the signs and wonders. Yeah, but you got beat up over it. And I don't know, was it God? Was it the enemy? I don't know what's going on. But James says no. He appeals to Scripture. Okay? That's the key. He appeals to Scripture and he says this. This is from the prophets. This is from Amos chapter 9. After this I will return, says the Lord, and I will return rebuild the tent of David that has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins and I will restore it that the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord. Who's the remnant of mankind? The nations, the Gentiles. And all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who makes these things known from of old. So there you go. All of you knew it. He prophesies the book of Amos. God said he'd collect all the Gentiles by rebuilding the temple of David. All of you said, of course. Now I get it. (laughs) Let's figure this one out, okay? All right. Who built the tabernacle in the wilderness? Moses. Do you remember what the tabernacle looked like? God told him, you better be careful how you build it because it is a little model of heaven. There's the brazen altar where the sin sacrifices go. There's the water where you wash yourself clean. Then you enter into the holy place. There's the light of God's revelation. There's the bread of God's food. There's the incense of the prayers. And then you go behind the curtain where there are the angels covering and you go into the holy of holies the throne room of god and as you're in the throne room of god there is the ark of the covenant the mercy seat and the covenant that god made with israel that went with them wherever they went that was the heart of israel god's presence okay many don't realize david made a tabernacle Because who was king before David? Saul. So the tabernacle of Moses, after they finally got into the promised land, was in Gibeah. And the priests offered sacrifice, but nobody really paid much attention to it at all. It was all dusty and weeds and overgrown and all this kind of stuff, you know. And uh, they, they took the ark out into battle and they lost it. And the, and the Philistines took the Ark of the Covenant and the Ark knocked down their God and then they sent it back by an ox cart and it was just kind of hanging out. People, Saul didn't even go to it. He went to witches and palm readers instead of the Ark of God. David knew better. He said, we got to get the presence of God back in to the nation. So on Mount Zion... He purchased a place on Mount Zion, the place where David repented from his sins. David bought that land and he went to get the ark, not the tabernacle of Moses. He he didn't even take the whole system of sacrifice. He just wanted the presence of God. Well, there's some problems with that. We won't get into it, but he eventually gets the ark back. He pitches a tent 
It's not Moses' tabernacle. It's an open tent, and he puts the Ark of the Covenant in the open for everyone to see. He then appoints Levites and priests to worship 24-7, round the clock, worship and thanksgiving, praise and offering prayers to God. Constant worship, constant praise for everyone to go and participate in and see the glory of God. So the presence of God was exposed to Israel for the life of David. David was king for 30 years. That's the tabernacle of David. Then later Saul builds his temple and all that. But this period was very important to God. Can you think of another time when God's presence was exposed to all mankind for 30 years? The presence of God tabernacled in Christ. This was a picture of Jesus. And this prophecy says that I'm going to rebuild the tabernacle of David and call all the Gentiles to myself. That's the church. That's the church. You and I are to be the tabernacle of David. You see, there were no sacrifices offered in the tabernacle of David. Should we be offering a sacrifice for our sins, bringing bulls and goats and lambs? Why not? It's done. Once for all. There is no other sin offering than Jesus. There's only one offering left for the church to bring to God. Praise. The fruit of our lips. Giving praise. This is the tabernacle of David. We are the tabernacle of David. We are the ones who are exposing the presence of God to the nations. We're the people who praise and exalt. Praise is a very powerful force. When you lift Christ up, the Bible says the Spirit is poured out. We're to be praising. That's why we start our services with praise and adoration, declaration. It changes the atmosphere around this city. It exposes the presence of God to where there's darkness. We're the tabernacle of David. This is God's plan. That's why James says, wait a minute, this makes sense. We shouldn't go back under the law. I remember the prophecy. God is going to bring His presence to the nations. He's going to rebuild the tabernacle of David that had fallen down. The Jews had failed in the temple. What did Jesus do in the temple when He got it there? He said, it's done. What did He do to the fig tree? Cursed it. It's done. Your ministry, Israel, is over. You failed miserably. You didn't bring the light to the Gentiles. You kept it to yourself. You became a den of thieves, a people who hoarded the presence of God. He flipped it over and He said, you're done. That's why Jesus said, when you say to this mountain, be cast into the sea, He was pointing at Zion from the Mount of Olives. That temple is done. And what is the sea? Figuratively in biblical language, it is the nations. This mountain of God is now cast into the nations for all to see and hear. We are the church. We're the light. This is what God has waited for. James got it. He figured out, oh my gosh, this is it. This changed the course of the church forever. And we're finally now on target in the book of Acts. Isn't that awesome? That's awesome. Now they're going to write a letter saying, you know what? We're going to have to figure out how to get along. Because the nations, these Gentiles, were pagans. You saw in that city how they acted. They see a move of God. They want to go worship Zeus. 
So we got Gentiles getting saved, and we've got Jews who've known God all along, who have followed righteousness, and these two guys are now going to sit in the same room together? We've seen what happened, even with the leadership. So you know what? We're going to have to write something out so that they'll get along together. They realized we should not add anything to what Christ had accomplished on the cross. And uh, we're going to write a letter. We're going to let all the Gentiles know and all the Jews know that this salvation is for everyone. Now, that means Jews and Gentiles are now going to gather together to worship Yeshua, Jesus. Can you think of any problems with a bunch of Jewish people, believers in Jesus that have followed the law, gathering together with Gentiles in the same room. What do you think? What kind of trouble are we going to get into? Dietary laws. Dietary laws. Very good. What's that? Yeah. Basically, Gentiles are unclean. How are they going to clean up so that we sit next to them? Here's another thing. Wait for this. Women are going to be allowed in. What? Women and dogs. Well, that's what Jews used to call Gentiles. Now you've got the nations gathering with the Jews who are the light of the world, the separate city on a hill, yet Jesus says, no, it's for all now through Christ now they've got to come together and sit together. Wow. That's awesome, isn't it? The church is never to segregate anyone from gathering at the cross. Right? We're, there's to be all, all people, all sinners should have the same availability of the cross. For salvation. This gospel is to all nations, to all people. This is a key portion of Scripture. And so they had to work through the problems. They had to work through the different people groups that they had to get used to. And so they said, you know what, let's write a letter. And they begin the letter. James says, this is what we're going to say. The brothers, both the apostles and the elders... Okay, the apostles are the twelve. The elders, is James and the ruling authorities in the church of Jerusalem. Listen to this. To the brothers who are of the Gentiles. In Antioch and Syria and Cilicia, greetings. What's so important about that opening statement? Count them as Brothers. To the brothers, you can say brothers and sisters, right? To the brothers and sisters who are what? Gentiles. Another word for Gentiles. Whenever you're reading the Bible and you see the word Gentiles, put in the word nations. Nations. Okay? Because that's who Gentiles are. The nations. Remember this gospel. It was God's plan all along to always draw all nations back to Him. All peoples back to him that's why he was using israel they were going to be the one who brings messiah they're going to be the light to draw everyone to israel guess what in the end times where is all the nations going to gather and meet israel and they're going to get a reception from somebody and he will show himself so to the gentiles this is awesome this is huge it's not to the future uh brethren It's not to those who get circumcised, it's to my brothers in the Lord. So what does he say? He says this, for it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. That's the order it should be in. (laughs) It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay on you no greater burden than these requirements. Now, these are not requirements for salvation. What are the requirements for salvation? Yeah, ask Jesus, faith in Jesus. There are no requirements. You you have to come to the cross and ask Christ 
into your heart. You die to self, you repent of your sin, and you receive Jesus. What are these requirements for? Why are they giving them requirements? To get along. These requirements are not requirements of salvation. These are ritual requirements. In other words, how Jew and Gentile can worship in the same building. This is what we're asking you Gentiles to do. All right? So what we want you to do is that you abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols, abstain from blood and from what has been strangled and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these, you'll, you will do well. Farewell. <laughs> Straight to the point. All right. So why these four requirements? What, what did Gentiles do in this time, in this place? They were pagans. So what did they do in their worship and in their religions? sacrifice to idols idols are false gods demon paul calls them demons so they used to offer pagan rituals so they would sacrifice to idols you can't come to jesus and keep sacrificing to idols hmm let's think about that for a minute how many of you what do we put our devotions to What do we worship? In this country, we worship money. We worship money. We worship fame. We worship... What else do we worship? Self. Yeah, that's that's key, isn't it? That's probably the king of all idols. Self. Basically, we have it written down. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We believe in freedom. But we've re- redefined freedom. We're a long way from what freedom is. We're move, we've moved into, I deserve, I want, I'm this, I'm that. You know, we've, we've gone to the height of narcissistic gluttony. Don't bring it into the house. That's what James is saying. Clean your act up. All right? So we've got to watch out from things offered to idols. Secondly, from blood. All right, what, let's talk about blood for a minute. What, uh, give me a quote from the book of Leviticus, chapter 17, verse 11. You win the car in the parking lot. <laughs> Somebody give her your keys. <laughs> the blood, the life is in the blood. Life is sacred, blood is sacred. But when you spill the blood to an idol, When you eat blood, some pagans used to eat blood, people eat blood, blood pudding, blood sausage, blood, blood, right? Okay, in the the New Testament, it's not so much a dietary thing, it's what you did with the blood. What are we offering the blood to? It's sacred, it's holy, okay? So we've got to be careful of that. The pagans would, would be involved with blood and unlawful death and so forth, sacrificing even their children. To bless your house, many pagans would take one of their infant children and put it in the foundation, in a jar, yeah. All right, so none of that. You're saved now. You're born again in Jesus. You can't offer to idols anymore. Skip that. Don't eat meat offered to idols. Though you didn't offer it, don't eat it. And blood, don't eat blood, don't get mingled with blood, blood blood is sacred, and and any blood should remind you of the blood of Jesus Christ. And he goes on, he says, from what has been strangled, we're still in the realm of pagan worship, okay? Now, if you strangle something and don't drain it properly of the blood, then you got you still have the blood which makes you unclean and, and to the Jew that's a huge offense. Well, you know what? Why should we be paying attention to them? Why shouldn't we just be able to do what we want to do? I'm serious. Why? Why not? It's offensive to God. It's offensive to a brother. Paul has to explain this to the people in the book of Romans. He says, don't be a stumbling block to your brother. Your conscience may be clean. It may not be an offense to you, but if it offends your brother, don't do it. 
We need to consider that with one to another. And then last of all, sexual immorality. Now, of course, we know, according to the gospel, you, the only uh, place for sacred sex is in a marriage. Sex before marriage is fornication. Sex while you're married to somebody else is adultery. But in pagan worship, there was all sorts of sexual stuff going on. And you're to stay away from that and to be clean. A realm of that would be pornography. Uh, uh, the realm of staying from sexual immorality, the word is pornea. And it has, it's a bigger category than simply adultery or uh, uh, sex, fornication. It, it is pornea, which means all aspects of uh, voyeurism, pornography, fondling, any kind of sexual stuff. Stay clean. And this is the idea, purity and cleanliness. When we come together, see the Jews had lived a very strict life of being ritually pure. Okay? But now the Holy Spirit dwells in us. We're supposed to be the temple. The temple's no longer in Jerusalem. Where's the temple? Right here. You are the temple of God. You're the living temple of God. We forget this all the time. We think it's an analogy. It's not an analogy. It's not a, a picture for us to think about. It literally is that you possess the Spirit of God in you. So we should not be mingling in sexual immorality what we're watching, what we're listening to. Right? And I, 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 there's very little left and the airwaves for you to watch. Very little. Um, maybe cooking and carpentry and hunting, I don't know. But let's watch what we're, what we're exposing ourselves to when we come together, right? And the things strangled, the things choked off, the things that, that are, are offered to strange fires and strange idols. This is what the church said, we believe that you are brothers 100% and sisters 100% because the Holy Spirit came into you and sealed you. So we're not going to add any other burden to put on you for salvation. What we're adding and what we are asking for is that you would walk in a way that would bring peace to the body of Christ to Jews and Gentiles, so that you could get along. I think we should review that for ourselves and for each other. In the sense of, are we caring for each other? What do you wear when you come to church? Are you being a stumbling block to somebody else? What are you saying when you come to gather together? Are you divisive? Are you gossiping? I mean, we could replace these, can't we? I mean, that was for the ancient Middle East 2,000 years ago for them to get along. Let's update it to today, to the American church. When I went to Russia, one of the things they taught us is they said, you're going to have your Bible with you. Never put your Bible on your seat. I was like, well, why not? Guess why not? Because that's where you put your butt when you sit down. Not in, you, you see, because in Russia at the time, I was there in 91, it, it was communist Russia. This was very precious to them. And so you honor this book. You don't put it on a seat and you dare not lay it on the floor. I, you know, those, uh, for them that mattered. So we had to get culturally told what to do so that when we went in there, we would not offend them. Pakistan, if you're going to walk around, ladies, put a head covering. Now, is that in Scripture? I've got my liberty in Christ. I don't have to do that. That's true, but all things are what permissible, but not all things are beneficial. 
To whom? The body. So wear a head covering for the respect of everybody else in the room. Is that really that hard? Right? See, so that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to care for each other. You know? So think about what you're doing with what you're wearing. You know, in the summertime, ladies, cover up, please. Guys' eyes are wandering. They don't want to wander in church. Cover up, right? Guys, take a shower. (laughs) You know, whatever it's going to be. But consider the other people. We are so all about, don't tell me what to do, and I've got my freedoms. That this is really hard for people. But we should be respecting each other. Does that make sense to you? All right, so abstain from what is offered to idols, abstain from blood, what's strangled, and sexual immorality. That's what they asked them to do. All right, so let's finish this up. Acts 15. Uh, So, verse 30. When they were sent off, they went down to Antioch. This is Paul and Barnabas. Having gathered the congregation together, they delivered the letter. When they had read it, they rejoiced because of its encouragement. Yeah, we're, we're brothers in the Lord. We're sisters in the Lord. We're accepted. Judas and Silas, who were themselves prophets, uh, encouraged and strengthened the brothers with many words. And after they had spent some time, they were sent off in peace by the brothers to those who had sent them. All right? But Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord. Some days later... Paul said to Barnabas, hey, you know what? Let's go back to the city where we started our first missionary tour. And then we get into the argument. We discussed this. We went over the entire split of Paul and Barnabas. All right? Now, what I want to conclude with is this. Jew and Gentiles coming together, this is the most important thing that the church has come to understand. So please turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2. Paul writes about it and about what happened. 2.14. All right, we'll start at 11. Therefore, remember that at one time, you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ or Messiah. You were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise. The promises of God were all to Israel. Actually, they were all to Abraham. Because Israel was Abraham's family. And all of this was the Abrahamic covenant. And God kept building up the Abrahamic covenant building it, building it, building it, till Messiah was going to come and die and release all the promises to all the nations. You had no hope and you were without God in the world. But now in Messiah Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. That's a term you'll see a lot, Paul using, far off. What does he mean by that? You are far off. Away from God, specifically the temple in Jerusalem where God's presence was. Gentiles were what? Far away. You were far off from the presence of God. But now through Jesus, who put away the temple and is the temple, who has now come and is approaching all the world through Christ Jesus. Here we go. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh, Jesus' flesh, the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments and ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of two. All right, unwrap this thing. So Jesus gets nailed to the cross. And he abolishes. Somebody tell me what abolish means. Destroy. Get rid of. 
It's gone forever to abolish. What did he abolish? The law. And he specifically says all of its commandments and all of its ordinances. That means, you know, some people don't get this. They, they uh, especially folks who, uh, who are uh, messianic, not messianic, uh, Jewish roots. There's a movement in the church, let's go back to our Jewish roots. There's some people who think they're closer to God if they sing Jewish songs. And if they hold a, a flag for Israel, they feel God loves them more. <laughs> no. All the ordinances. Some people feel they have to follow the, the dietary laws of the Old Testament. Because God gave them, so we should keep them. This says it's gone. It's abolished. He told Peter, don't call unclean what I call clean. Right? Some people say you have to worship on Sabbath. You have to meet every Saturday on Sabbath. It's the law. It's what God said. What did we just read that he did with every ordinance and every law of God? Abolished it. Why? Because all of it pointed to him. He's our purity diet. He's our Sabbath rest. He's our cleansing. He's everything. And his goal is to create in himself, Jesus, one new man in place of the two. What two? Jews and Gentiles. There is no more Jews and Gentiles for salvation. Right now, there's one covenant people. Who are they? Christians. For a Jew to get saved, what do they have to do? Come to Jesus. For a Gentile to get saved, what do they need to do? Come to Jesus. And we are equally in Christ. Now, we didn't replace Israel. The church didn't replace Israel. God still will bring Israel to salvation. But how is God going to bring Israel to salvation? Through Jesus, there's no other way. Okay? So he's going to come to Israel to save them, but how are they going to get saved? Zechariah says, they shall look upon him whom they have pierced. They have to come to Jesus. Okay? So, Gentiles and Jews, there's only one way of salvation, is Jesus. Now, let's go on. And might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. There should be no hostility between, in the church between Christians, between Jew and Gentile. 17, and he came and he preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near, Jews and Gentiles. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Messiah Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure joined together grows into a holy temple of God. See, the church didn't replace Israel. The church replaced the temple. That's the difference. We replaced the temple, the presence of God. In Him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So, this sets the tone for the rest of the Bible. The rest of the book of Acts, the rest of the missionary trips, the rest of Paul's letters, the rest all the way through Revelation till Jesus returns. There is one temple on the earth. It is the church. There's one place that houses God. It's the church, both Jew and Gentile. Now, it would do us Gentiles well to learn Judaism in the Old Testament because it'll help us understand the depth of our salvation. But there's so many people right now that that have a misunderstanding of of Jew and Gentile. You know, I, I hear so many people say, yeah, but the Jews are God's chosen people. You are God's chosen people. You are not a second-class citizen in the kingdom of God. 
When it says to the Jew first, then to the Gentiles in the book of Romans, the reason Paul says preach to the Jews first, then to the Gentiles is it's because he said they had the oracles of God and there will be a greater judgment on them. Not because they're better. You've been grafted in. You are equal. If Israel's God's elect, you're God's elect. If Israel's God's chosen people, you're God's chosen people. Okay? So, so there's no difference between Jew and Gentile in the body of Christ. We are one new man. Do we have something to learn from Judaism? Absolutely. Absolutely. Jesus said salvation comes from the Jews. So if we learn more about Judaism, I mean, he's, Judaism, uh, yeah, salvation came through the Jews. So if we learn more about Judaism, we'll learn a deeper depth of, about Jesus. That's good. But Jewish believers are not closer to Jesus than you. All right? You don't have to do something special. Uh, if we blow shofars, then God's going to really hear our prayers. No! Blow a kazoo. It doesn't matter. Is there a reason behind shofars? Yeah. All right? I mean, there was, there was then, but it doesn't... Do you understand what I'm saying? We see people who wear prayer shawls, Jewish prayer shawls. And maybe you do. God bless you. That's great if it gets you in that mood. Right? I can wear a knapsack. I can wear corduroy. I can wear anything. It doesn't matter. I'm not going to get closer because I, I have a, a pendant of David, the Star of David. I'm not trying to offend anybody, but I'm sure trying to blow away the wrong theological concepts that Judaism is closer to God. You have the living Spirit of God Himself in you. Amen? Amen? So Jew and Gentile, there's one new man, the body of Christ Jesus. There's no Jew nor Greek, right? There's no slave nor free. There's no male nor female. We are all one in Christ Jesus. There's no second class citizens in the kingdom of God. Amen? Yeah, praise God for that. Amen. Let's close. Father, I thank you that we have learned this pivotal point in the book of Acts of what Jesus has been trying to teach His twelve, what He tried to teach the church, and what He has now through the Jerusalem Council established for all time that Jesus died for all people everywhere. May we be one body, not divided, but together in one spirit, praying to the Father for the nations. Amen. I want to finish off tonight with some prayer. So...